we are live uh, so uh, shall we begin yeah, we can wait for maybe a couple of minutes So I guess we can start now. Okay, okay. we'll start. Um, welcome everyone who's joined in. Today we have with us Dr. Kushal Shah uh, as our next speaker in the MLRW lecture series. Um, Dr. Shah is the principal data scientist from our title partners of MLRW uh, LUC Data. So some of you who have participated in our hackathon would know of LUC Data and the kind of work they do. Um, Dr. Shah has also previously served as an assistant professor at IIT Delhi. He has completed his PhD from IIT Madras and has a plethora of experience in both academia and industry. Uh, today, he'll be taking up the topic right at the intersection of biosciences and AI and how um, he uh, and his team at Elucidata are working using MLAI and how it is going to greatly enhance our understanding of the same in the near future. So without taking any further time, I'll let him take over. Uh, thanks a lot, Manan, for the kind introduction and a uh, very, very good afternoon uh, to all the participants. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, biomedical data curation uh, through data centric AI. So I will uh, cover what is biomedical data curation, what is data centric AI and how it is uh, different from what is conventionally called model centric AI. Uh, and I'm going to keep this talk at a very broad level uh, so that you can understand the a broader picture of what is being done in this area and what are the opportunities. Uh, and uh, for a specific discussion, we can always you know, connect later on. And if you have any questions uh, during the talk, please feel free to ask in the chat box. Uh, you know, I would like to have this as an interactive session, although uh, we can't interact directly because this is being live streamed. But uh, you know, through your chats, uh, you know, I can get your queries and questions and I'll be happy to answer them uh, during my uh, presentation. Uh, so let's begin. So before uh, getting into biomedical data curation, we need to get some context about biomedical research and how it connects to other kinds of scientific research uh, that happen in the scientific community. So generally, when we think of science, uh, you know, we think of physics naturally. And, and when we think of physics, we think of particle physics. This is a very beautiful picture that was captured uh, from CERN in the, uh, 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 in, in the big collider that we have where this uh, person, Lucas Taylor, has captured these two protons which traveled in a straight line. They collided uh, with each other and they generated the Higgs boson and a plethora of other uh, you know, particles. This was one of the uh, most beautiful experiments, I would say, performed in physics in recent time. And this has given us a very good understanding of how the world behaves at a, a fundamental level. Now, physics has made lots and lots of advance, uh, advancements in the last 100 years, and we have, uh, you know, able to derive uh, very basic equations through which we can explain a lot of physical phenomena, which we observe in our daily lives, and also very esoteric phenomena, which we can create in our labs using various kinds of devices. However, the interesting thing here to note and understand is that all these complicated equations of physics that we see, especially in the subatomic domain, of course, there is general relativity, which is, you know, different, but in the subatomic domain, all these complicated equations of physics are essentially based on this simple concept of a simple harmonic oscillator, you know, which you must have, uh, you know, studied in school, you know, it may sound very bizarre to you that how can such a complicated, uh, you know, particle physics equation be reduced to a simple harmonic oscillator, but that is what makes physics so beautiful. That's a, something so simple can explain very, very complicated uh, phenomena. However, the same 
principle which in uh, uh, you know some terminology can be called as reductionism doesn't work very well when we come to biology so when we come to living systems you know although of course you know all these uh, systems are also eventually made up of these particles which we study in particle physics but when we come to these living systems or these biological systems the same approach that has been so successful in physics doesn't really work very well you know even though you may know how a proton how a, how a neutron and how a higgs boson is going to behave but that doesn't really help you in predicting how a living system is going to behave and that is because the fundamental unit of a living system is a cell uh, you know this is a you know a caricature of how a cell looks like so here you can see that a cell has many different components within it you know what a physics approach would imply is that you rip apart this cell you take out its various components and study them individually which people have been doing for many decades and they have gotten very deep insights from it which is great but to really understand how a cell works you have to look at it in a holistic manner the moment you rip it apart and you take out one element out of it you have destroyed the cell and what you are studying now is a component of the cell which behaves very differently when inside the cell and when outside the cell so this is why the way you deal with biology is going to be very different from the way you deal with physics and here because of this complexity research in biology is lot more driven by data than research in physics so physics is largely driven by models because mathematical models have been extremely successful in predicting physical phenomena but in biology also we do have mathematical models but their success has been very very limited because the level of complexity that we are talking about is enormous and also because you have to see living systems in a much more holistic manner where all these components have to be seen together instead of you know looking at them separate from uh, each other so why should we you know as engineers uh, you know worry about it or why should we as a machine learning community or ai community worry about biology you know isn't biology something that only biological researchers and maybe some pharma companies or some you know medical labs do the answer is you know provided by this very beautiful graph uh, that is from this paper in the uh, cell uh, journal uh, which was published in 2015 so this is a very interesting study which was done by uh, some of my former colleagues in israel where what they found is that you take blood glucose and you measure the blood glucose of a person over a period of let's say 120 minutes as you can see in this graph on the x axis and here they have taken several patients uh, but here there are two particular participants whose uh, data has been shown so on the top there is a participant 468 and the bottom there is a participant 663 what they did is that they gave these two participants the same amount of glucose and the same amount of bread to be eaten at time t0 and then they measured how is their blood glucose changing with time after they have taken this piece of food what they found is that one participant shows a heightened glycemic response when uh, he or she takes glucose as compared to bread and the other one shows a larger response uh, when he or she takes bread as compared to glucose and they did this for many other uh, people and what they found is that there is a large variability in the glycemic response across participants across people but for the same person the glycemic response seems similar although not exactly the same because you can see there are differences in these graphs also but they are similar and very interestingly what they found is that if you take the gut bacteria and some other uh, you know biological data points from each of these participants by using machine learning techniques they can actually predict how their body is going to respond for certain types of food so the future of medicine is of course you know very unpredictable we don't really know how it is going to be but personalized medicine based on genetic factors based on your you know other uh, you know biological data is going to be very very important and here machine learning ai is going to play a very very important role now when you do research you know when you let's say you want to 
do another let's say study on glucose you know let's say you have a ai team and you want to see okay let's let's see if we can improve the results that these uh, guys have uh, you know uh, gotten what will you do the first thing that you will do is that you will go to google and you will search that are there other people who have done similar kind of research that is the first thing that will come to your mind that hey okay this research is great uh, you know we are impressed but let's see if there is other data other research available in the market can we extract all of that and then can we analyze them and come up with a better machine learning model which can predict how this uh, system is going to behave or how a person's body is going to behave uh, to certain uh, food items now great you can go on google and you can uh, type in whatever keywords you want and you can press enter the problem is that google will give you thousands and thousands of papers which you know if you start reading each of them you will essentially spend your entire life and still you will not be able to read all of them so what phd scholars or you know research students do is that they then start you know using some intelligence they start selecting a few papers and then they read them and then they do their study using that but that's again a very limited approach because then you are selecting only a few data sets out of the thousands and thousands of relevant data sets which may be available but but which are hidden amidst this larger plethora of papers and it is almost impossible for you to figure out uh, you know which ones are going to be relevant for you and this problem is uh, you know aggravated because 80% of data sources they do not have any mechanism to search on samples or data sets you know google doesn't really provide that facility and there are a lot of other biologically dedicated uh, you know databases but there also finding relevant data sets is uh, you know not very easy and even if let's say you are able to find those uh, data sets through some mechanism uh, more than 50% of annotations in these data sets are missing i will come to what annotations mean in a short while and even when the annotations are present they do not really follow a common vocabulary so it's very difficult for a researcher to actually uh, figure out that okay what all research has been done in this particular area what all data sets are available so that he or she can then apply machine learning models to make various kinds of predictions so let's say you you know somebody has a uh, some form of cancer and you have some data about their uh, you know genetic composition or their tissue images and you want to predict whether the person is going to survive or not the first thing is you need data and that is what is very very difficult to find you know so there is a information boom now but finding relevant information is very very difficult so for example this is one paper from this uh, journal called oncogene which is a you know very very popular journal in the biology community so here this is the abstract of a research paper uh, which is published the terms which are underlined in red are some of the important terms that will be relevant to annotate Uh, you know these documents so that's the first one says uh, mutations in the tp53 tumor and blah blah about human cancer there is a tumor malignancy there are three different cancer cell lines p53 and all these important terms are embedded in this abstract and now if you want to know that okay does this paper talk about tp53 or tp57 it's not uh, you know very easy you can of course you know do a simple string matching but that doesn't work very well because you need to know the context also you know there may be some papers where this tp53 is also mentioned but in a different context which is not relevant to what kind of research uh, you want to do so this is what makes it so complicated that we don't just want to search for relevant keywords but we also want to search for those keywords in a certain context and sometimes you know the context but you do not know the keyword that is also what makes this so so complicated and just a usual manual search uh, doesn't really help it is not sufficient so to solve this problem what uh, biologists did is that they uh, you know formed a various community this is one of them called the international society of biocuration so this process is called curation where you take some let's say data and you annotate that uh, in uh, you know various ways and earlier it was done manually because the Uh, machine learning models and these you know new transformers bert and all that they were all not available so largely they were done manually and this is a society where you know they have like annual meetings where they discuss okay in, in what ways can we uh, make our curation better faster more accurate and you know stuff like that 
now this is fine uh, but again there are only so many number of uh, researchers you know who are again have the time energy to do uh, you know curation so then uh, there were some uh, you know uh, researchers who came up with this idea of crowd sourced uh, you know curation so this is for example uh, one such leaderboard which was uh, you know uh, started by a researcher for curating cancer data sets so they what what they did is that they took this cancer data sets and they you know uh, uh, outsourced it to their community and then they used some ways to cross check whether uh, certain submissions by two people if, if they were in agreement if they were not in agreement and some such ways were uh, you know found to uh, you know do these kinds of crowd sourced uh, you know curations however this is again uh, you know great but again has limitations because here we are not talking of 100 data sets or 200 data sets or even 1000 data sets we are talking of the tune of you know lakhs and maybe millions of data sets so for example poly which is our in house uh, software platform where we provide curated uh, data sets to our customers it has around 1.5 million data sets you know so you can well imagine the scale at which uh, you know uh, we are working and if we let's say want to scale this 1.5 million to let's say 5 million or 10 million we cannot hire uh, you know let's say 1000 uh, you know bioinformatics people to do the curation it it just doesn't work uh, that way so the only option is to come up with language models which can solve this uh, problem for us in a accurate way you know you can of course apply some language models and get some results but unless it is of high enough quality Uh, nobody is going to uh, you know buy it so that is the challenge uh, that we have uh, in front of us so when we talk of uh, you know artificial intelligence and machine learning we of course think in terms of artificial neural networks because they are uh, you know one of the most powerful machine learning ideas which uh, you know scientists have been able to come up with so i i believe you guys uh, you know are uh, already familiar with uh, these basic concepts i will not spend any uh, you know great amount of time on this but just want to emphasize on this concept called universal approximation theorem uh, according to which you know any artificial neural network can approximate any mathematical function which you are trying, trying to estimate so artificial neural networks are very very powerful theoretically but from a practical perspective they have certain limitations and the limitation Uh, is the following so let's take an example of you know a spam message this is a spam email which i got uh, you know few days back so it says uh, that they will uh, you know uh, give me 10 million dollars which which i know of course is fake uh, so google has become extremely good with uh, you know spam detection over the years you know earlier a lot of spam used to come to the inbox but nowadays i think almost all spam goes to uh, the spam folder so sometimes some of the good emails are labeled as spam that problem is there but i think at least spam emails are almost always uh, you know labeled uh, as spam so now let's say if you want to solve this problem of spam detection using classical machine learning methods what you will do is that you will manually extract some features you know you will either you know count some number of words or you will see if there is a money mentioned in the email if some large um, some uh, if if a large uh, you know money amount is mentioned uh, that is likely to be a spam and some such features you will extract and then you will take these features you will feed it into this artificial neural network and then using this uh, data set you will try to predict whether uh, the uh, you know result is either a spam or a normal email now that is uh, you know great but that doesn't work very well because feature extract extraction is again not very easy you know it's very difficult to say especially for language problems and computer vision problems uh, that what kind of features are going to be relevant to solve for a particular problem so that gave rise to this whole field of deep learning and that is the difference between classical ml and deep learning that in the in deep learning we do automated feature extraction you know when you use deep learning you don't tell your model that okay hey use this particular feature for uh, you know prediction the model figures it out on its own now that's a great thing but the issue is that these features are currently very very abstract so although we have these amazing models Uh, which are able to make these amazing predictions uh, but we do not really understand what is it that these models are uh, you know trying to do and that is of course a uh, area of research in itself called explainable ai but currently uh, you know that is a problem but at least uh, you know we are able to make very good predictions by using these uh, you know deep learning models 
so uh, you must have heard about these models called transformers here is a uh, you know small a small transformer which you see on your screen uh, so these transformer models were uh, proposed a few years back and it has taken the uh, machine learning community by storm after the transformer model was proposed there was a uh, you know transformer based model which was proposed by google few, again few years back Uh, which has again taken the world by storm and it has uh, you know shown a uh, great performance in many diverse uh, you know sets of uh, you know nlp tasks i will again not go in lot of detail about bot but i will just mention a few points and interestingly what uh, microsoft did is that uh, it took bot the bot model and it trained it on uh, biomedical data so the original bot which was released by google was on generic wikipedia articles and general english articles Uh, that was great but that was not very effective for solving bio problems because what people found is that uh, the bio context was missing in the original bird model so then there are many variations of course uh, of these bio related bird models but pubmed bird is uh, you know one of the best i would say in the market there is bio bird bio albert and so on but pubmed bird uh, which was released by microsoft is a very very popular one so here this transformer uh, you know image which i have chosen is of a small uh you know kid i would say a, a, a kind of some kind of a kid transformer and not an adult transformer because although these bird models are very very powerful and they can do lot more than what the earlier models like rnns lstms were able to do but still we have a very long way to go you know sometimes when we get some success we start thinking that okay we have solved everything but you know i would just like to you know uh, you know uh, share a small reminder that you know we still have lot of work to do still there are lot of you know problems Uh, within these transformer models uh, that need to be solved because before we can really talk about you know having solved uh, uh, you know the ai problem so bert of course has you know a lot of uh, complicated things but essentially uh, the core of bert is what is called the self attention mechanism and this is a very interesting uh, you know article uh, uh, which you can search on google the illustrated transformer by j alamer uh, it gives a very good explanation of what the self attention mechanism is so without again getting into a lot of details what the self attention mechanism does is that it understands the relationships that words have with each other so let's say you know we have the sentence the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired so here each word has a certain relationship with other words and what the self attention mechanism does is that it helps us in figuring that out that which word in a sentence is more closely related to which other word so that these relationships can be understood using which uh, various kinds of predictions uh, can be done so now uh, this bert model is based on this concept of self supervised uh, machine learning and uh, to be more specific it uses what is called the masked uh, uh, masked language models uh, so here let's say you have these uh, two sentences you know the patient is taking saridon to manage recurring headaches and the second sentence is patient is taking ibuprofen Uh, to manage recurring headaches what this mass language model will do is that it will mask some of the words so here the saridon and ibuprofen have been masked and now the model will have to predict what that uh, word should be so of course as you can see there are multiple uh, you know options which are there which need to be predicted which make this uh, somewhat complicated but you know that's that's a uh, ambiguity that uh, you know have to uh, you have to live with now this particular approach is uh, uh, you know great but we cannot use bird directly for our uh, biological tasks because we don't uh, just need to predict the word but we also need to figure out what is that word representing you know so when let's say you have some data about some drugs uh, the words or the uh, you know uh, various information available in that abstract or research paper Uh, could be representing the strength of a drug the form of a drug the dosage why was the drug given you know the reason what was the duration for which the drug was given all these various kinds of information which are present in that particular data set or research paper need to be extracted so just a simple mass language model is uh, you know not really enough and you need to do more than that to be able to extract uh, the information which you require so that brings us to this concept uh, called weak supervised learning because if you wanted to uh, you know do this uh, prediction by using label data you would need lots and lots of available manual manually labeled data 
but that again is not available because manual effort is you know quite expensive you know you cannot just uh, go around hiring 500 or 1000 people to do manual curation for you and expect that to you know work that will work up to a certain scale uh, but not uh, you know beyond that so in order to address such uh, you know challenges uh, you know people have proposed what is called weak supervision models and this is what brings us to this whole domain of data centric ai so the primary difference between model centric ai and data centric ai is that in model centric ai you assume that you have high quality label data available with you and your job is now only to find out good enough models which can give you uh, the correct predictions with high enough accuracy however in real life that doesn't really happen you do not have that much amount of label data even you know models like bird and transformers they were so successful because they they were able to train themselves without requiring label data as i just showed you about the mask language model uh, that you know uh, the, uh, the the bird was trained on you know millions and billions of data points without requiring any labeling what they did is that they randomly just Uh, masked some of these words you know around 15% words in the in the in the entire data set and then they trained the model to be able to predict uh, that particular word so we basically need to develop techniques which can help us in finding or achieving good enough accuracy without having labeled data to begin with so now the models have become reasonably good i would not say perfect there's still a, lo a lot of work to be done but the models have become reasonably reasonably good but data has not been able to catch up and that is because we are producing data at such a high rate that you know taking care of data quality and all those issues is uh, you know not uh, uh, very easy uh, so this is why now people have started you know thinking very hard about can we solve machine learning and ai problems without requiring uh, manually labeled data and that is why semi supervised learning self supervised learning and all these other variants have become uh, you know so popular so there are a lot of techniques in data centric ai which uh, which are being uh, you know used nowadays but i'm going to talk specifically about weak supervision because that seems to be a very promising approach uh, especially in this domain of uh, you know bio nlp so this is a uh, you know work uh, uh, a particular uh, a package uh, of uh, weak supervision called snorkel Uh, which has been uh, published in this journal bldb journal it is by a group from stanford university so what they do is that instead of having actual labels they will ask you to provide labeling functions so what labeling function means is that suppose you have given paragraph so let's say this paragraph itself is there which is in front of you now if you want to label this for names that which are the words in this a uh, paragraph which represents some name so here snorkel is a name of a package uh, then i yeah, then i guess there is no other uh, name over here so let's say only snorkel is there so now you need to find some rules by which you can identify okay this word might be a potential name in this uh, you know paragraph now the interesting thing is that when we want to do such kind of labeling manually generally there are multiple criteria that we have you know not just one so here for example there could be a particular labeling uh, you know task that you have to do for which there are potentially let's say three labeling functions which you can have and what we do mentally is that once we have these three labeling functions somehow our brain figures out okay if these three labeling functions are in conflict then it knows uh, you know some way of resolving the conflict and finding the correct label for that uh, you know particular word and this is essentially the idea which is incorporated in this concept of weak supervised uh, learning so they take these let's say three or five or whatever 10 uh, you know labeling functions uh, that they have and they label each word in the document using these labeling functions now as i said naturally there will be some labeling functions which will be in agreement and some will be in conflict and which one is in agreement which was in uh, which one is in conflict will also keep changing for every word you know maybe that for the first word the five first five labeling functions are in agreement but maybe for the second word the second fourth and the eighth labeling function are in agreement so these things keep changing so what they do is that after they identify the labels using these labeling functions they have a generative model which learns 
from these labeling functions and identifies a probability for each label that you know if a probability of a label for each word you know so so first you began with labeling functions you had labels for each labeling function then you trained a generative model to identify what could be the probability that this word has a particular label after identifying that they pass it through a discriminative model which is your regular uh, you know ann uh, also uh, can work in this case where you train that discriminative model that okay here i have these inputs and here are my output the output are the probability values which are estimated by the generative model and now once you train your discriminative model you are then able to predict whether a word will have a particular label or not for any new data uh, that you have so here uh, you know this is the basic idea that instead of having labels you have labeling functions you have multiple labeling functions so that when some of them are in conflict and some of them are not in conflict you can learn better about the rules at an abstract level and then you use a generative model and a discriminative model to learn what are those rules at a slightly abstract uh, uh, you know level so this idea of weak supervision was of course there uh, previously also but earlier papers mostly used a voting mechanism that if you let's say have 10 labeling functions and let's say if six of them are doing are predicting a particular label you just go ahead with that now that is all right that is good to begin with but its accuracy is again not very good so that's why these uh, snorkel folks came up with this idea of using a generative and a discriminative model uh, you know in combination so that the accuracy can be improved by learning more abstract Uh, representations of these uh, various uh, labeling functions after that is another uh, library again which is uh, you know available in the public domain called skv uh, which is again based on a very similar idea however they claim that uh, their accuracy is better than uh, snorkel which uh, you know of course needs uh, verification uh, you know by other people but at least uh, this is also another very interesting promising idea that is uh, you know available in this Uh, you know domain of bio nlp where you can use uh, weak supervision to uh, do various kinds of uh, you know tasks so here as as you can see the uh, the the basic process is the same uh, that you start with a corpus of raw unlabeled uh, documents uh, from the target domain you apply the labeling function they have uh, divided the labeling function into various categories heuristics gazetteers and there are there are two more categories total four in number Uh, and then they used a different model as compared to snorkel so they still have this uh, you know discriminative uh, generative concept that is still uh, the same thing but they use a different model from what uh, what snorkel is using and then again finally uh, you know train your whole network and you are able to make predictions so this is basically the concept of uh, you know weak supervision which is one of the uh, you know sub concepts of data centric ai that you know instead of worrying about or instead of assuming that you already have labeled data available can we use some more intelligent techniques to be able to extract relevant features from our data without having to manually label uh, uh, our our data sets and this you know field has just started i think over the last two years and in the next few years this is going to really boom because as i said data availability is growing at a breakneck pace and we do not have enough people uh, you know who can manually curate all this data so this data centric ai is you know going to become very powerful and you know those who spend time in understanding uh, these models and becoming good at it are going to have very great opportunities in the future you know till i think 3 years 4 years back or maybe even 2 years back you know just knowing models was good enough but you know no more you know now we have to worry about uh, data because that seems to be the real bottleneck in most ai problems so now all that is fine but you know that is again uh, you know kind of limited you know as i said uh, we are just starting you know there is lot more uh, work to be done and for example this uh, paper from nature in 2008 uh, you know shows why uh, bio curation and biomedical nlp is such a challenging problem to solve because you know it says that a human gene uh, some cdk n to a has 10 literature based uh, synonyms and one of those which is p14 is also a synonym for five other genes you know so to confirm the identity of genes described the curators make inferences from synonyms reported sequences uh, biological context and various other uh, you know information sources so you can 
see that you know uh, bio nlp is not just taking bert and applying it on biological data and then you're done with it no uh, when you go into a particular domain you know the domain complexities uh, come into the picture and you have to now work with your nlp knowledge add on to it your domain knowledge from bio you may not have that you can always collaborate with a biologist who can bring in that domain knowledge and a combination of this domain knowledge and strong data centric ai principles is what is going to create the magic that we will see in the coming few years now as i said you know bert uh, you know is a great model but uh, you know the story is not finished you know we still have a lot more work to do so this is a very interesting paper published uh, you know in 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 uh, in in some journal which has taken bert and it has done an adversarial evaluation for bert and seen whether it can uh, you know uh, perform well even when there are adversaries means the data has been you know willfully tampered uh, with and and they found uh, you know for example as you can see uh, you know our results indicate that under these adversarial settings the performance of the models drops significantly you know so uh, so although you know bert in itself is very powerful but there are easy ways to make the models work uh, you know poorly so this is something that uh, you know one has to work on and uh, this is another paper called breaking bert you know understanding its uh, vulnerabilities and ner through adversarial attack so here also they find that you know uh, that bert models are vulnerable to variation in the entity context uh, with 22 20 to 45% of uh, the entities predicted predicted completely wrong and another 29 to 53% predicted wrong partially so you can see that uh, you know there are ways to uh, you know make your model uh, you know give all kinds of wrong predictions and this is again something uh, that we need to work with so so as i said there are three things you know largely that uh, we as a ai community has to start doing first of all there is lot of model work that is still there that uh, that is true uh, i totally agree but largely we also need to do lot of data work you know for example some of these issues with adversarial attacks could perhaps be taken care of through a data centric approach and need not require a modification in the model itself you know those are things that we need to uh, work on and then the third thing is how can we bring in domain knowledge into the picture you know so instead of just taking bert and applying it blindly on this data can we bring in domain knowledge into uh, the picture and use some of the concept that biologists you know have known for for decades to improve the accuracies of our models and prevent such adversarial attacks from making a significant impact on our uh, various kinds of accuracies uh so now uh, you know although this is something very important and many people realize that but the reason this is uh, you know not so popular is you know very well documented in this paper by google uh, which i would strongly recommend all of you to read so it says that everyone wants to do the model work you know and not the uh, you know data work uh, so uh, and this is a very high stakes ai you know so uh, they have used this term for a very important reason you know ai is a very high stakes game you know it is you know currently you are in college so for you maybe it is you know a matter of fun and learning which is which is all great uh, but when you go to companies you know google facebook amazon or even startups like our company eluc data ai is not just a matter of fun but it is a matter of growth or no growth you know if you are able to crack this ai puzzle if you are able to really develop good data centric ai models and tools uh, we will be able to leverage that uh, technology to make rapid progress in our field and serve our customers at a much uh, you know larger scale uh, but currently that is not uh, you know in fashion currently still Uh, most people are in the model centric uh, you know domain but i uh, sincerely hope that changes over the next uh, you know couple of years and more students especially start realizing the importance and value of a, a data centric approach uh, which will hopefully uh, you know make help us in making rapid progress in this uh, 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 you know domain which certainly is you know extremely uh, extremely important uh so this is our uh, you know polybert model uh, which you know enables uh, harmonization of multiomics uh, data at a uh, you know very large scale so we have trained uh, you know a model with millions of parameters using your you know 17 billion words and we have a language model that is uh, you know working uh, for us at a 
very large scale. So we have again started on this journey, but there is a lot more uh, work to do, and we are happy to have uh, you know uh, many of you on board to help us in solving some of these uh, challenges which face not just uh, the bio community, but I would say the entire global human community. Because as I said, this will impact everybody's life. You know, it is not just a matter of uh, somebody doing some research in a lab, but actually, you know, the drugs that come out of it, the personalized medicine techniques which come out of this data, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, which will be available through our efforts will make a significant difference to the quality of life all around the world. So uh, apart from the serious work uh, that we do, we also have a lot of fun. So these are just some pictures uh, from our team. Uh, so we had a co-working session in Delhi, uh, you know, some time back. We also had a session to, to celebrate, uh, celebrate our gender diversity, which is uh, we are very proud of. So, you know, we are still not, I would say 50-50 when it comes to, uh, you know, gender diversity, but still we have a very large, uh, you know, fraction of our, uh, uh, you know, team, uh, which is, which is, uh, which is also uh, uh, belonging to the other, uh, you know, gender. Uh, so that, you know, helps us in maintaining at least some amount of diversity, but we are still, uh, you know, hoping to do better in the future. And uh, these are some, uh, you know, images from our, uh, you know, Slack channel, just, uh, you know, having fun uh, while we uh, do some serious work also. Uh, so thanks a lot, guys, for your kind attention. I hope this uh, talk was useful to you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be uh, more than happy to answer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kishal. That was a very insightful talk. Um, I'll, so anyone who has any questions can put their questions in the chat. We'll be taking the questions now. So um, one thing which I, I mean, really liked was, so <laughs> um, uh, we have this notion that bi um, biology is something which is very boring, right? Uh, which I think um, uh, others which had this idea like me would be thinking, would have, like the talk would have changed their mind now. I too had this notion. So when I completed my 10th class in 1998, I was extremely happy for two reasons. First of all, I won't have to go to that same school. And secondly, I won't have to study biology. Uh, but after 10 years, uh, you know, in 2009, as I, uh, you know, was telling you earlier that when I went to Wiseman for my postdoc, uh, that mm -hmm. is when I started realizing how exciting biology can be when looked at from a data science perspective. You know, if you, if you look at biology uh, from the perspective of just biologists, you may not be able to appreciate all the interesting stuff. Uh, but for engineers like us, you know, when we look at biology from a data science perspective, it becomes, yeah. uh, you know, very, very fascinating. So, yeah, I mean, I am now totally love with, uh, totally in love with biology, a subject which I used to stay away from at, uh, you know, some point of time. And I, I sincerely hope that our young generation, uh, you know, realizes that, uh, you know, as we go along. Uh, right. Uh, I think we have a question. So, uh, yeah, the labeling... Uh, which you mentioned is trained on label data. No, uh, no, Ayush, the labeling function is not trained on uh, label data. So uh, we do not have label data over here. So we have labeling functions which are written by uh, people who understand the domain. You know, you need somebody with the domain knowledge. So we, if we have to manually label all these data sets, it would take a very, very long time. So what we do is that we come up with some heuristic rules. Uh, using which we can, uh, you know, say, okay, that this is what this label, this word uh, may represent. So, so there are, there are no label data that uh, we use uh, in, in these methods. Uh, am I making sense, Ayush? Did you understand? Okay. Uh, also, uh, so like um, what all of us like in at college level, we only looked at the model centric AI. Can you like shed uh, throw light on data centric AI, which you talked about? Yeah, as I said, there are several different ways in which data centric AI can be done. There is no one single thing. Uh, one approach, as I mentioned, is the uh, you know this weak supervision. There are a lot of other uh, uh, you know methods uh, which are there which i 
sort of you know didn't want to get into because it is like you know an infinite universe uh, you know i would say yeah uh, so 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 generally uh, you know when we talk of uh, data centric ai uh, there are two levels at which we can talk about it you know one is at the more basic level of let's say cleaning the data you know doing some pre processing mm-hmm. filling the gaps so those uh, you know things are there but uh, uh, but i think the more interesting part are these uh, you know kinds of algorithms which uh you know uh, uh, which take the data and they apply these data centric models i would say you know so one is a purely data centric uh, you know thing which is data cleaning data uh, uh, preparing you know. the data high quality huh? data the yeah, preparing yeah. the high quality data right 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 so so that part i would say is somewhat more boring but i think huh. to a ai community this would be like you know easier step to move from a model centric approach to a data centric approach you know, because if i start talking of you know data cleaning and all that that will seem like you know a lot more uh, you know mundane uh, you know kind of yeah, work yeah very boring and tedious very boring kind of work yeah so that's why i thought of you know focusing on these techniques uh, because this is i would say a, a, a somewhat in between you know it is not uh, totally that uh, you know boring neither it is mm-hmm. just you know modeling uh, kind of work so it is somewhere in between and can provide a very good bridge uh, if people want to trans uh, transit from a purely model centric approach to a somewhat a data centric approach yeah makes sense um if anyone has any questions then they can put it in the chat how oh, i think we have another trans- question formers like biobot train on bio data sets in industry yeah that's a very very uh, good question uh, jay so as i uh, showed you yeah so earlier uh, you know the first uh, uh, you know bot model was uh, given by google and when google was applied on uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, when this bot model by google was applied on bio data its accuracy mm-hmm. was found to be uh, not so good so then people took this bot model and trained it on further uh, you know bio data and that gave rise to uh, you know biobot now biobot is also excellent it also works very well uh, pubmed bot is different from biobot because biomart uh, biobot took the already uh, you know pre trained bot and then trained additionally on the biological uh, data sets but pubmed bot took the bot model from scratch and trained it purely on uh, you know biological data so that is an important difference uh, between the two uh, when it comes to which one is uh, better i would say that depends on i think the particular problem that you are solving for uh, but largely i would say the difference is not that significant you know it may be there may be like one or two problems here and there for which you know let's say biobot may be working much better there may be one or two problems here and there let's say for which pubmed bot could be working much better but they are uh, you know somewhat uh, you know similar the reason i have mentioned pubmed bot only over here is because it has been trained purely on biological data so it might be that you know it has a better understanding of the bio context but as of now uh, the results that we have uh, you know they are not very different from each other and uh, and, and these uh, models are definitely uh, you know very very useful because if you take the classical uh, you know machine learning models like you know rnns or lstms uh, that doesn't really work very well you know their accuracies are not very good uh, but these bird models uh, biobird pubmed bird work, work very well uh, but as i uh, shared that they have adversarial issues you know that it is easy to have adversarial attacks which uh, decreases their accuracy uh, significantly so that is something uh, we need to work on uh is it possible to use these huge transformers uh, for live production see the thing is that uh, there are two kinds of issues when it comes to production or two kinds of problems i would say so one is when you are working in a real time situation right for example let's say facebook google they have a real time system that you know when people are on facebook they are using it all the time and facebook needs to take these decisions you know at that instant you know it cannot say that okay i will tell you that image you are searching for after one week you know that time itself it has to say google also is you know working on such uh, you know real time things so when you are working on such real time situations uh, implementing these heavy models uh, in production is very challenging i totally agree and there if possible you would always want to use some other uh, you know kinds of models 
But in this bio domain that I am uh, referring to uh, over here in this talk, uh, we are not really talking of real time. You know, so let's say when we have these data sets which are available in the public domain, when we want to you know curate that, uh, we do not have to do it in real time. You know, it's not like that. A customer will come to our website and give some uh, you know requirements, and immediately we will have to curate and provide the data set to that customer. No, uh, the curation is done beforehand in the backend and. Only after it is curated and its accuracy has been checked, is it made available uh, to a particular uh, you know customer. So for our kind of problem, uh, you know the bio curation kind of problem, uh, uh, this live production is not a very big issue because we are not doing it in real time. Uh, does it answer your question, Jay? Make sense? Okay, are there any other questions? Thank you. Mm. So, uh, if there aren't any more questions, then I think we can end the stream. All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you, Kushal, for joining us. Uh, that was quite an insightful discussion. And uh, also, uh, now I think more of us would be taking more interest in bio-related uh, fields, right? Uh, Hope and so. so I thank you. Thank you, Manan. It, it was a great pleasure interacting with all of you. And hope to have more discussions on data-centric AI in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thanks. Thanks again.